You're gonna pay for all the NRL you killed today, G. We'll take him together. You're going slowly on the left. No, I'm taking him now. No, Scott, no! Ah! My life is a lie. Paul Gowan is very overrated. This was all so avoidable. For all the stick we give Trump for torching the US-China relationship, we went so much further for such little gain. And this video is going to show exactly how what was once a happy enough marriage ended in bitter divorce. But before we do that, let's go back 15 years to 2008 where our Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, was literally speaking at Peking University in Mandarin. You see, as we begin our story in the late 2000s, of course China was not as close of an ally as say America was, but instead they were defined by a word that Rudd used called Zhang Yu, which meant critical friend. And for Rudd's time in office, this proved to be a fair word to characterize the relationship. While Rudd criticized China for its occupation of Tibet, and as WikiLeaks revealed he'd spoken to then Secretary of State Clinton about containing China and calling them emotional about their attachment to Taiwan, he also made a series of agreements that secured Australian supplies for Chinese energy. Not only that, but Rudd had pulled Australia out of the early talks for a quadrilateral alliance with the US, India and Japan, which would then encircle China. As far as the Chinese were concerned, Rudd was far from America's annoying stepbrother and could be negotiated with. However, neither country's leader would survive going into the 2010s. Kevin Rudd was brutally knifed by his deputy Julia Gillard, while Hu Jintao's term expired and he was replaced with a guy you might know called Xi Jinping. The official story is that Rudd was at risk of losing the 2010 election to the Liberal Party, but let's be real, the truth is that Rudd wanted to implement a mining tax which would reduce the profits of US mining companies, and so the pro-American faction bosses within the Labour Party had him knifed. As Gillard came in, she pivoted quite heavily towards the US, expressing a revival of interest in the Quad, and allowed US troops to be stationed in Australia. Though China certainly wasn't pleased with this, this was only viewed as a dry spell within the marriage, and divorce was never in question. For instance, Gillard and her foreign minister Bob Carr met with Xi Jinping and his premier Li Keqiang to secure even closer economic ties. And after Tony Abbott's defeat of Labour, the two then signed a free trade deal in 2014, and in November of the same year, Xi Jinping spoke in Australian Parliament. If that wasn't enough, get this right, he even praised Australia's innovation and global influence. But in 2015, for the fourth time in less than half a decade, Australia saw yet another leadership change as Malcolm Turnbull knifed Tony Abbott. And as Turnbull came in, he was really feeling the pressure not to be so warm on China. Malcolm, what is Abbott doing? You are giving China the Kerry Packer treatment. I want this fixed now. And so the breakup really begins here with Turnbull. You see, Turnbull was a huge supporter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Basically, an economic network that excluded China so that all countries involved wouldn't become dependent on them. But that in of itself isn't too antagonistic towards China because China knew that Australia was in no position to say no to Uncle Sam. Where Turnbull really put them offside was when he tried to keep the partnership alive, even after Trump withdrew America from the agreement. But still, it wasn't just that. You see, China has long claimed the South China Sea to be their backyard, ultimately appealing to the authority of the Nine Dash Line around the sea that Chiang Kai-shek of all people drew before losing the Chinese Civil War. However, after a dispute between the Philippines and China went to an international tribunal in The Hague, the tribunal ruled that there was no authority to the Nine Dash Treaty. Immediately, Turnbull's government released a statement urging China to submit to the ruling. On top of that, Turnbull was eager to move towards the Quad, and the end of 2017 saw an increased number of East Asian security summits. China was really starting to get suspicious now. However, Turnbull would still go even further, introducing espionage laws which were aimed at legislating around foreign donations to political parties. Now, that in of itself is a very sensible law. But what's important here is the subtext. Australians might remember this guy, Sam Dastyari. Well, Dastyari was a senator for the Labor Party and had close ties to the Chinese business community. Essentially, he'd earlier declared that a Chinese business linked to the Communist Party had helped him cover his legal bills, and he himself had brought donations into the party from Chinese billionaire Huang Zhangmao. 
Now, this wasn't illegal, but Dastyari then gave counter surveillance advice to Zhang Mo and contradicted Labor's policy of not recognizing China's claim to the South China Sea. It's also crucial to remember that the South China Sea is both important for trade and a potential early battleground should a third world war break out. With Steve Bannon trying to twist the arm of Trump into a trade war, America really needed Australia in line. Malcolm, how on earth can you let this same Dastyari do run our whole operation here? A Donald who even invited this guy. You true, Commander Cody, execute Order 66. It will be done, Mr. Trump. And so, America had Turnbull knife too. <laughs> Just joking. Well, no, he actually did get knifed, but unlike Rudd, it had nothing to do with the US. It was all about energy. But that brought forth to the table Scott Morrison. And very quickly, Scott Morrison made it clear as to who he supported. In fact, he was even a bit too gung-ho about his anti-China stance for America's liking. So in July of 2019, two months after Morrison shocked the nation by winning re-election, his government signed a letter condemning the detention of Uyghur Muslims. Now, 21 other nations signed this, so this in isolation wasn't breaking point, but it was, however, a tipping point. Because once a government sends the message that the government has huge human rights issues, to oppose that country then becomes the moral action. You might remember the Hong Kong protests back in 2019, as they wanted further autonomy from the PRC. Don't lie to me, you were definitely watching Hassan Piker be like, This is outrageous. Hong Kong needs to be liberated from Xi Jinping now. And quick shout out to the Mr. Mitchell History Podcast. Well, how did that get there? But throughout the protests, Morrison consistently voiced support for Hong Kong. And ultimately, when the Hong Kong security law, effectively a declaration of martial law, was enacted in 2020, Australia openly opposed it. Now, Australia didn't have to do this. India abstained from voting at the UN Human Rights Council, and countries like Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and even Papua New Guinea all voted in support of the law. But it would be in 2020 when Australia would turn this quiet divorce into a bitter divorce. So obviously COVID happened, and the Chinese origins of the virus were the topic of conversation. In America, Trump was rallying on the China virus and making the origins the topic of conversation. Hey Morty, let's call for a spicy cuffin quest and end our relationship with China. Cooking it out 15 minute adventure. I don't know man, that seems kind of risky. Far out. Are you a commie Morty? Tell me Enrique. And so sure enough, Australia, need I add without prodding from the US, called for an independent inquest into the outbreak of COVID with the diplomatic message being that China's lying about the origins of the virus. China's response was swift, placing huge sanctions on Australian beef, barley, lobsters and coal. China's huge population to consume agriculture and seafood could basically cripple those Australian industries overnight, though not without cost as they themselves were fairly reliant on Australian coal. Morrison and his foreign minister, Maurice Payne, would continue to take jabs at China and as America's relationship with China deteriorated, Morrison continued to point Australia in the direction of America. Now, Scott, today you're auditioning for American Idol. Tell me, Mr. Morrison, why should you be the next American Idol? Well, that's a very good question, Simon. I can do what not even an American can do. I can get John to run up a list of 14 grievances against me. Well, take it away. So as Australia continued to be critical of China, China released a list of 14 grievances that they had with Australia. I obviously won't read all of them, but some highlights included the accusation that they were doing the bidding of the US, meddling in what China considered internal affairs like Taiwan, Hong Kong and Xinjiang, and the fact that they were the first country not in the South China Sea to make a comment on China's actions in the South China Sea. By this point, the relationship had gone from Zhang Yu in 2008 to China writing a diss track about Australia in 2020. And today, I want to ask you this question. Who would you rather have as your country's leader? Scott Morrison or Xi Jinping? Also, liking the video doesn't hurt us. But in 2021, the relationship would continue to deteriorate. At the beginning of the year, Maurice Payne declared China's actions in Xinjiang as a genocide. And once genocide is thrown around, there's no going back. Not to mention that in September, Morrison also signed Australia up for AUKUS. Now, I have another video that unpacks it all, but basically, Morrison cited China's military build-up as the justification for needing nuclear submarines. China's response was fury, with the CCP back Global Times saying that Australia was signing themselves up to be the first to die in the South China Sea. Add to this that the Minister for Home Affairs, Peter Dutton, said that Chinese ships had been found doing military exercises off the coast of Australia, providing further justification for the deal by calling it an aggressive act. 
By this point, the relationship with China had effectively been torched and going into an election in 2022, Morrison basically had two choices. One, amend the relationship, or two, own the fact that the relationship was destroyed and use it as a campaigning point. No surprises which one ScoMo took, but this would only cause further damage. Yo, Grievous, you remember when you said time to abandon ship? Yes, I remember that, John. That was wild. I mean, that's not even wild. When it came to the Chinese, we abandoned ship like six months before Albert even came in. Seriously though, Scott Morrison went hard. In December of 2021, he announced a diplomatic boycott of the upcoming Chinese Winter Olympics. All I can say is thank goodness Mario and Sonic didn't boycott. But Morrison then used China as a beating stick against Labour. Firstly, he called the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, the Manchurian candidate by being too soft on China. For context, when Japan invaded Manchuria in 1931, they set up their own puppet king. So the accusation was that Albo was doing the bidding of the Chinese. But then a month later, what was once an Australian stronghold, the Solomon Islands, signed a security pact with China that enabled them to use the military to protect their assets in the Solomons. The significance of this can't be understated as this is how close Chinese soldiers were then stationed to Australia's coast. So as a huge strategic blunder in letting the Chinese get this close to Australia, Morrison would have wanted to play this down, right? Well, no. Actually, even though he created this situation by neglecting the Solomons, it was perfect ammo to drum anti-China fear and Morrison completely played the Uno reverse card saying, It's odd that the Labour Party wouldn't say, no, it isn't because China is coming to interfere in our region, somehow it's Australia's fault. What I don't understand is when something of this significance takes place, why would you take China's side? And that right there for me was the nail in the coffin. The sitting Prime Minister labelled the two sides as Australia's and China's and suggested that even entertaining China's side was well and truly treachery. China and Australia were now truly divorced. When Albanese defeated Morrison in 2022, suffice to say that Albo had his work cut out for him if he wanted to restore the relationship. And I think a fair assessment would be to say that the two nations are still very much divorced, but they've agreed to get along for the sake of the kids. In June, the new defense minister, Richard Miles, met with the Chinese defense minister, Wei Fengzhe, in Singapore. These were the highest level conversations between the two for three years. That is damning considering Xi Jinping spoke in the Australian parliament in just 2014. The talks still weren't easy as China protested to Miles against AUKUS, pretty much a play of trying to talk Albo out of his campaign promise to support ScoMo's deal. Then in November, Albanese actually met Xi Jinping in Bali before China lifted their coal ban and then made a deal to finally end their Bali tariffs too in early 2023. Make no mistake though, Albanese's decision to support Scott Morrison's inclusion in AUKUS has for now well and truly ended any possibility of China and Australia reconciling. And that's why you don't want to click off just yet, because then you'd miss this video that fills you in on just how strong Asian opposition to AUKUS has actually been. Seriously, Indonesia is not happy.